This episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we take up the episode, The Corberbite Maneuver. Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of Trekking Through Compliance. His mission? To explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Episode 11, The Corbomite Maneuver. In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we consider the episode The Corbomite Maneuver, which aired on November 10, 1966, start date 1512.2. On the third day of star mapping, the Enterprise discovers a giant multicolored spinning cube. McCoy, who is giving Kirk his quarterly medical examination, fails to inform Kirk about the crisis until he completes his medical examination. As a result of this exam, Kirk's diet is restricted to salad, much to his chagrin. The cube has an unknown propulsion system, which prompts Scotty to admit that it beats me what makes it go. As the Enterprise tries to maneuver away from the cube, the cube begins emitting deadly radiation and Kirk is forced to destroy it. Responding to the destruction of what turns out to have been a warning buoy, a mile-long diameter spherical flagship known as the Fasarius rushes to the scene. It is piloted by Balok and belongs to the First Federation. Balok threatens to destroy the Enterprise for violating First Federation space and destroying the warning buoy. Balok gives the crew of the Enterprise 10 minutes to consult with their deity before they are destroyed. Prompted by uncharacteristic curiosity, Scott is Spock rather, is able to obtain visual image of the imposing Balok using the ship's monitor during this 10-minute waiting period. Kirk saves the day by pretending that the Enterprise is equipped with a secret Cobramite device capable of destroying any vessel which attacks it. Balok then offers to spare the crew of the Enterprise by towing it to a First Federation planet and turning the crew there and only then destroying the Enterprise. However, Kirk waits for the tow ship to expend its power then pulls away, crippling the power system of the tow ship. Kirk, McCoy, and David Bailey transport to the main ship, Vasarius, to render assistance. Here they meet Balok, the pilot of the ship, who greets them and offers them a drink called Tranya. Kirk and company find the image of Balok they had glimpsed was a phony puppet and that Balok is actually an unintimidating midget. It turns out that Balok did not trust the information he gleaned from the scan of the Enterprise's databanks and was simply testing the Earthmen to see what their true intentions were. Bailey, who had panicked during the crisis on the bridge of the Enterprise, remains on the Fasarius to exchange cultures with Balok. Fun fact. At the time of the filming, six-year-old guest star Clint Howard appeared. He's also the younger brother of former child actor and now Oscar-winning director Ron Howard. There's an interesting interpretation to this episode, which is more relevant after the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, which suggests that this episode is an allegory about the Cold War, the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and other similar events. Uh, Kirk can, in many ways, be seen as a representation of uh, John F. Kennedy um, when confronted with an unknown enemy who threatens them. Um, they uh, respond initially with a uh, violent uh, response or a very provocative speech. Uh, Khrushchev obviously uh, could t- take the place of the uh, puppet character who sat in the captain's chair. It, um, it's really an interesting way to think about this. Also interesting is this episode was the first episode of the regular series to be produced after the two pilots. And um, they were filmed in 64 and 65. Obviously, this one was 66. We were reviewing this in release date, not shooting date. Um, so that's the reason this one comes first. Uh, the episode was held back uh, until November 1966 due to the amount of special effects scenes which were not completed and it made it the 10th episode to be 
um, broadcast. NBC preferred planet-based stories, which were ready to air before this one, because um, the miniature footage was not completed or ready when the um, season series premiered, rather. So production issues speak to us again. Next up, what are the three compliance takeaways from the Corbin Knight Maneuver? So what are the compliance takeaways from this episode? Well, um, I think there's actually some pretty good stuff in this one if you just uh, kind of sit back and think about it. And the first is the cross-cultural exchange which occurs at the end of the episode between uh, Bailey and uh, Balok. The, uh, as a chief compliance officer, I'm always reminded by Lewis Sapperman's planes, trains, and automobiles argument, or at least moniker, that you've got to get out of the office. You have to get out of the ivory tower. You have to be not only seen by your customers, who of course are your corporate employees, but also you need to understand the culture of your organization literally in every country that you have an organization. For a compliance violation can arise literally anywhere. So what are you going to do? And having that type of cross-cultural exchange, when you get out of the office, it's simply more than uh, you communicating or you training. It's also information coming back to you. And this is a significant uh, point or part of a compliance professional's job is to understand not only the business, i.e. learn how to read a spreadsheet, but also um, understanding the culture uh, the culture in the Far East is going to be different than the culture in West Africa, then it's going to be different than the culture in Central Asia, then it's going to be different than the culture in the Nordic countries. It's going to be different than the culture in Latin America, and it's all certainly going to be different than the culture in the United States. So never pass up a chance for a cross-cultural exchange. Uh, second, uh, in the episode, Bailey uh, basically has a nervous breakdown during this 10-minute period before Balak had threatened to blow up the Enterprise. And he's relieved of duty, and Kirk sends him off the bridge. Uh, it's early in the 10-minute period, and uh, this was a clearly a disciplinary action. It was dip- disciplinary action made in front of Bailey's uh, crew members, crewmates, clearly by the captain. Uh, but he returns to the uh, bridge, and he asks for permission to resume uh, his role as navigator, which Kirk agrees to. And it really got me thinking about should does your disciplinary action have a remedial component or is it simply punitive? Uh, do you put a letter in somebody's file? Do you give them additional training? Do you monitor them going forward? Uh, if someone goes to prison and comes out, we would say they paid their debt to society. But is the same true inside of your corporation? So should discipline have a remedial component? Should Kirk have allowed him uh, back on the bridge when he had clearly folded up uh, literally minutes before? Is that something that is going to come back and haunt you as a compliance professional? Uh, If you have a person who is engaged in one compliance violation, does that mean they're going to engage in another? Uh, Is that indicia now that you can't use them or can't trust them or that you have to put additional risk management protocols around them? So what's the role of your discipline? Uh, Is your discipline administered consistently and fairly? And finally, how much stress can you or should you put on your employees? This 10-minute waiting period before the enterprise was allegedly going to be destroyed um, was uh, really uh, drawn out quite well, I thought, in this episode. And you could see the increased stress. Uh, Certain people dealt with it in certain ways. Obviously, Mr. Spock was not too emotional about it. Uh, Commander Sulu was actually giving a countdown uh, every 30 seconds, uh, much to the annoyance of Bailey and, in fact, uh, many others on the bridge. Nevertheless, how much stress do you put on your employees? How much uh, resources do you provide to them to help them to deal with this stress? And if someone is given too much stress, what does that mean going forward? I hope you'll join us tomorrow for our next episode where we look at One of my favorite episodes, The Menagerie, in part one of The Menagerie. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.